You've probably heard me talk before about the Internet of Things. You've definitely heard me talk about 5G, telecommunications infrastructure, the impact on the environment, EMFs, the rise of big data, technology in new sectors that we could not imagine them just maybe half a decade ago. And here is a new depth to that story. It's called the Internet of Underwater Things. Smart devices by the hundreds of thousands, maybe by the millions, dumped into the oceans with new ways of communicating, not like Wi-Fi that's on Earth, but below the water using sonic frequencies. So we're going to talk about cymatics, the power of vibration on a field and why that's super important for aquatic life. We already know the oceans are extremely important. I'm going to give you another taste of that today and hopefully leave you with some solutions that are a bit more upbeat than where we have to go first. So let's dive deep beneath the surface on this waking infinity microdose. Welcome back to Waking Infinity News. I'm your host, Ben Joseph Stewart. Today we're talking about the internet of underwater things. The reason why this is interesting is because as I was reading through Dr. Arthur Furstenberg's paper, which is now, it's called Cell Towers on the Ocean Floor, and it is diving deep into the internet of underwater things and also what he believes to be the impact that it very well potentially could have. It gets into a whole new cymatic level of conversation when we're talking about the way this Wi-Fi underwater is going to operate. There was a tsunami detection type of technology that's going to be deployed and this morning the Tonga Islands there was an underwater volcanic eruption with, with a tsunami watch all throughout the west coast. It didn't seem to be that bad at all. It hit Australia. All they got was rain. Not sure if that's connected. But the bottom line is, is it's, it's interesting that the Internet of Underwater Things is going to touch things like rising temperatures, lowering temperatures, tsunami detection, all these kinds of things that you would hope the data would be able to do for us. The bigger conversation here is at what cost and how quickly do we know how to develop the technology that's best for aquatic life. On screen, you can see the four nodes of the loon that we've put in the water this morning. In this case, we are transmitting data packets from node 4 to node 1. Google is laying about 4,000 miles of cable in the Atlantic Ocean to connect to Europe and also announced in August that it had struck a deal with Facebook, now Meta, to build a new cable called Apricot, which will link six countries in Southeast Asia using 7,456 miles of cable. Sunrise is a project funded by the European Union under the coordination of the University of Roma La Sapienza. The project has the ambitious aim to create the Internet of Underwater Things. Smartphone. Smartphones. Laptops and all devices around us are invisibly interconnected by wireless technologies. Wireless. Imagine, Imagine what it means to bring this concept, the Internet of Things, underwater. Dr. Arthur Furstenberg just recently published an article called Cell Towers on the Ocean Floor. Companies like Hydromia, Dynotics, 3D at Depth, Teledyne, Marine, Geospectrum, Voice, and more are just a few of the companies developing drones, lasers, smart buoys, GPS, and countless sensors that will soon flood the oceans. But these technologies won't use the same methods as land Wi-Fi. So they'll be using acoustic and sonic technology to communicate between sensors and data devices. Lindsay Walgart reviewed 115 research studies on the effects of noise on 66 species of fish and 36 species of invertebrates in her 36-page Ocean Care report. She writes, noise impacts on development include body malformations, higher egg or immature mortality, developmental delays, delays in metamorphosing and settling, and slower growth rates. Anatomical impacts from noise involves massive internal injuries, cellular damage to statocysts and neurons, causing disorientation, even death. If the rate of population decline continues, there will be almost no fish left in the oceans by 2048. 
The oceans are absorbing 24 million tons of carbon dioxide every day, and they are 26% more acidic than before we began burning fossil fuels. They've also absorbed 93% of the heat generated by greenhouse gases since the 1970s. The damage already done to coral reefs by acidification, rising temperatures, and bottom trawling would take 100,000 years for nature to repair. Diatomes, a type of algae at the base of the ocean's food chain that is also the source of a third of the world's oxygen, have been declining by more than 1% per year for two decades. Populations of krill, the smallest shrimp-like crustaceans that make up a large portion of the diet of many species of whales, penguins, and seals, have declined by 80% since the 1970s. And the deepest layers of the oceans are severely depleted of oxygen, so much so that deep diving fish no longer dive deep, but remain near the surface in order to breathe. Large numbers of bottom-dwelling crabs have suffocated on the coast of Oregon. More than a thousand manatees died of starvation in 2021 off the coast of Florida because the seagrass they eat has been killed by pollution. And there is so much plastic throughout the oceans that sardines sold in an Australian fish market have been shown to contain three milligrams of plastic in every gram of their tissue. So it can look like a grim scenario. It can. It can also look like an opportunity for conversation to break out a little bit more. The pressure is being put on. People need to speak out about things. And there, yes, there's censorship. Really, like it, the censorship today is just a new iteration of what censorship always has been. And it's always been around. We're just talking about it in internet standards now and social media standards. And soon we'll be talking about it in Web3 standards. And these are, these are all parts of the solution. And yes, some of the solutions come from technology. The interesting thing about the internet of underwater things is we just don't know what it's going to do because 5G isn't even really fully operational yet. We don't even know what that might do. Maybe it'll just do more of the same thing that is happening right now, which to most people who are insensitive to it is nothing. Nothing at all is happening there is a way forward in this that does not look like the most obvious route. It's not a linear A to B route. It circumvents a lot of that. It's by opening the conversation in more intriguing and less inflammatory ways. That's what I think the 2022 solution is going to be. Finding how to nuance the way of communicating it so we're actually showing that we do understand that there, there's a call and a demand for more telecommunications infrastructure because we're going to the metaverse. We're going to this fully interactive um, sp spatial web, if you will, virtual augmented reality where the internet touches you in different ways. It's not just from a tiny little screen, it's coming at you through something two inches from your eyes, maybe glasses just augmenting the reality, maybe full virtual reality. In your ears, haptic suits, potentially cocktails that they say, you know, like take this MDMA ketamine patch right before going into this virtual experience that's going to basically be a shamanic experience, but it's in the metaverse. These are all things that are, to me, they're just absolutely com coming. That's why a lot of psychedelic companies are getting into the IPO thing. The IPO thing shows you that the Black Rocks and the Black Stones and the investor class, which is just a class of people. I I'm not trying to make them out like, um, like the beard and mustache villains in movies. What I am saying is there are big changes and most people aren't seeing how different things can get. And maybe it's not understood that when things get different radically, panic starts to set in and we start to behave erratically socially. I don't want there to be some top down, we need to impose measures because the 99% the is getting out of control. I don't want to see that being provoked. What I want to see is something that circumvents all the inflammatory conversation by really bringing it home to an artistic revolution 
we're here to inspire people, which is what art does. It's meant to. I believe that it's meant to. The inflammatory stuff is the lower denomination. It's the, it's the least intelligent aspect of art. Real art is meant to inspire beauty. It's meant to bring beauty to an artifact that people can witness, whether a film or a sculpture or whatever it might be, that can change them. That's why I became a filmmaker. Because in an hour or two hours, with the right soundtrack, visuals, concepts, pacing, tone of voice, you can change somebody's life. You can change the way that they think. You can change the way they approach reality, the way they engage with their family, the way they see the importance of relationships and community. You can change people's trajectory with art. That's what we need more of. And that does come from the grassroots. As much as we can point at all the problems coming down from the top, one big thing that can be pointed right back down to the grassroots is we're not leveling up the conversation. We're not getting more sophisticated and more poetic at a rate that I would like to see. That's what I'm looking to inspire. With that being said, I love you all. Please get engaged with what's happening to global waters everywhere and within you. And I will catch you all next time. Thank <laughs> you.